Welcome everybody to another lesson from Explore the Bible. This is the Lifeway curriculum and it's session number 11. The title for today's lesson is Trust Exhibited. We're going to get to see Daniel show some remarkable faith in the Lord and his trust is on display here before us in this chapter. So uh, join me now as we pray. Let's ask the Lord to teach us all. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so, so much for preserving this account of the life of Daniel. I thank you that there's so much we can all take to heart from Daniel's example. He was clearly a man led by your Holy Spirit. He had the utmost trust in you. And I pray that each of us will come away from this lesson trusting you uh, with everything in us. And I pray that our lives will bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm, I'm really glad to have you with me here today, and believers can trust in God in all circumstances. We don't always know, in according to God's providence, we don't always know how God will handle a particular circumstance, but we know He Himself is trustworthy. Uh, he has given His only begotten Son so that you and I could be saved. Jesus willingly gave His life. And the idea here is if God is for us, who can be against us? So we understand God is for us based on his giving of his son Jesus to die for us. So whatever else may happen, uh, we don't always know how things are going to work out. But in the long run, we know without any shadow of a doubt that God is for us. He's initiated the process of saving us. He will complete the task he's finished, and knowing this, we should exhibit our trust in him always in all things. All right, here we go. We're going to look at these slides here. There's our title page, Trust Exhibited, Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 through 24, and uh, I'm going to just go back and cover some of the context from the entire chapter one of the benefits of walking with God you know for many years is that we get to see firsthand how the Bible's always right about everything the Bible's right about money the Bible's right about true contentment it's right concerning sex and marriage if we honor the instructions God's given us with obedience if we honor God obey him uh, in matters concerning sex or marriage or money or anything else, um, God is always found to be trustworthy. In uh, positions of leadership, people who are led by the Lord make better leaders than those who are not. In relationships, people who trust in the Lord to help them to have a healthy relationship find God is able and willing to help and so much more. Long-term believers who live by God's principles see them validated again and again. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll move on now to the... I'm going to give you a little bit of background here and uh, a summary of our lesson. Believers can trust God in all circumstances, and believers must worship God alone, even when others try to limit their worship, and we can turn to God in prayer when we and others face persecution. Now, God vindicates faithful believers for his honor. All right. Now, I want to go back to the context here, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 28. The prophet Daniel served under at least three kings. He first served under King Nebuchadnezzar, and second, he served, un he served under King Belshazzar. Uh, this is when he interpreted the handwriting on the wall for him in chapter 5. And he also had two significant visions during Belshazzar's reign. Uh, that's in chapter 7 and chapter 8. Well, third... Daniel chapter 6 records that Daniel served Darius, the first king of the Persian Empire. 
And based on some of the datable events in the book of Daniel, we can calculate that Daniel was probably close to 80 years old during the events of Daniel chapter 6. And Darius had appointed 120 officials called satraps to administer his kingdom. And he also chose three administrators, including Daniel, to oversee the satraps. Now Daniel distinguished himself in service so well that the king considered appointing him over the entire kingdom. Now Darius's favor toward Daniel did not please the other officials. They were jealous and not happy that uh, Daniel did everything so well, but they could find no charge to bring against Daniel due to his trustworthiness. Daniel was an honest man, a godly man, and they tried to find fault with him, but they could not. He had a godly character. Well, they finally decided perhaps they could trap him in something that uh, had to do with his relationship with his God. So, they suggested to the king, Darius, that he establish a decree that for 30 days, anyone who petitioned or prayed to any god or person beside the king would face death in a den of lions. Well, the king signed the edict, which meant that it could not be changed. Now, Daniel learned about the edict, but continued to pray to God three times a day as he had done before. Well, Dan that's exactly what Daniel's accusers hoped he would do, and they knew him well. And so Daniel's accusers found him doing so. He was in prayer. And then, as a group, they went to inform King Darius that Daniel had disobeyed the king's edict. That's in verses 11 through 13. The king was displeased when he heard this, but he was unable to determine a way to rescue Daniel. You'll see that in chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. So ultimately, at the king's order, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, and the king could not sleep that night. He hurried to the lion's den at dawn. He cried out, hoping to hear Daniel's voice. Daniel replied that God's angel had shut the lion's mouths. The overjoyed king then ordered Daniel's removal from the, the den, and Daniel was found unharmed. The king then ordered Daniel's accusers and their families thrown into the den where they all perished. Darius sent word throughout the kingdom that people should honor Daniel's God, who was able to do incredible wonders, including saving Daniel from the lions. And after his deliverance, Daniel continued serving in the Persian court. So there's so much to this. Bottom line, you and I need to trust in the Lord in the midst of anything that occurs in our lives. There's a, a day coming when we'll each stand before the Lord to give an account of what we've done with our life here on earth. And my camera's getting a little off here. I'm going to move it around. Um, trust in the Lord no matter what's going on in your life. Uh, he is faithful. Trust in Him regardless. Uh, we've seen earlier in the book of Daniel that God arranges circumstances. He, he brings kings to their positions of power and authority when He chooses to. And when he chooses to take them out of authority, he does so. King Nebuchadnezzar learned that pride would lead to a great fall, and God humbled him greatly by temporarily taking away his sanity. He ate grass like a cow for about seven years, uh, and um, uh, when that when he acknowledged that the Most High was in charge of all the kingdoms on earth and he gives them to who he pleases, then uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, 
uh, sanity was restored and his kingdom was restored and he was even more greatly blessed after that than, than prior to that time. And uh, hopefully, uh, when God humbles us, it's, it's never to harm us. It's simply to show us uh, who he is and who we are. God has humbled me in uh, a trip uh, that I didn't want to take. He allowed me to uh, go to the federal penitentiary at one time, and it was necessary and needful, and I praise God that he allowed that to happen. I'm ashamed of it. I'm, um, I hate that it happened, but it, but it turned me to Christ. It served to um, cause me to come to Christ. It was an amazing thing. It was it was exactly what I needed to be converted. So I'm thankful to God for that. And um, uh, I didn't understand exactly what was happening, but God uh, allowed those things to happen or actually brought me into those circumstances so that I would finally stop trusting in myself and I would begin trusting in him. So he did that for me, and I, I'm very thankful that he did so. All right. Well, believers can trust God in all circumstances, good or bad, right or wrong, regardless of how they turn out. <clears throat> and believers in, in Jesus Christ must worship God alone, even when others try to limit their worship. We can turn to God in prayer when we and others uh, face persecution. And God vindicates faithful believers for his honor. All righty. Let's look at this passage here. The trap is set. Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. These uh, other ruling agents, these satraps, despised uh, Daniel because I'm sure his uh, performance was far better than theirs, and he was honest and a man of character, and I would imagine it brought them conviction just to be around him. So they prompted the king to issue an edict that no one could pray to anyone except him for 30 days. The penalty was being sent to the lion's den. The king uh, apparently didn't think that through too clearly, so he signed the document. And now this is where we begin in, in verse 10 of chapter 6, book of Daniel. When Daniel learned that the document had been signed... He went into his house. The windows in its upstairs room opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. Um, Daniel's daily habit of prayer, he's probably about 80 years old by this time, um, he's in a habit of praying every day. In verse 10, they, these men had basically conspired to get the king to outlaw what Daniel routinely did in praying to the Most High God. And um, prayer was a daily habit for Daniel. He's going to do this uh, day in and day out. And sometimes it got him into trouble with human beings. But today we're going to see how his faithfulness to God was rewarded by God. So choose the choose ye this day whom you will serve. Serve the living God and uh, trust him in the midst of anything and everything. And he's looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. That's Second Chronicles sixteen nine. Well, <clears throat> just as he had done before, uh, that's a description of Daniel's prayer life. Daniel was not going to stop praying to God. His heart was bent on pleasing God. Uh, the king had issued a, a an edict here, but it's not going to phase Daniel. He's not doing this to rebel against the king. His his heart is into, his heart is God's, and he's communicating with God. He's he's linked with God in a, a relationship here. He's indwelt by 
God's Spirit. And that communion is going to continue uh, no matter what. So Daniel would face Jerusalem whenever he prayed. And that, for Jews that were not in uh, Israel, if they were away from Jerusalem, typically they would kind of face towards Jerusalem when they prayed. And Daniel was giving thanks to God. Um, he, he gave thanks to God daily, and it was a, a habit. Uh, it was not just um, something he did by rote. He was genuinely thankful to God, and the thanksgiving just came out. Um, well, when Daniel became aware of these new regulations, he didn't use prayer as a form of protest against the culture. He just simply carried out his spiritual disciplines as he had always done. He'd, he'd been doing this since he was a youth. Well, um, let's read a little bit more here. That was just two verses, 6, 10, and 11. And here's 12 and 13. So, they've caught Daniel praying. So they approached the king and asked about his edict. Didn't you sign an edict that for 30 days any person who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, As a law of the Medes and Persians, the order stands and is irrevocable. Then they replied to the king, Daniel, one of the Judean exiles, has ignored you, the king, and the edict you signed, for he prays three times a day. As soon as the king heard this, he was very displeased. He set his mind on rescuing Daniel and made every effort until sundown, to deliver him. Now, the king had been duped, more or less, by these cunning uh, satraps. They kind of tricked him into signing this edict. I don't know why he didn't think through more carefully what he was doing there, but uh, they put him up to it, and he signed it, and then... When he realizes the effect this is going to have on Daniel, now he's sorrowful, he's very displeased that he has fallen into their trap, so to speak. He, he signed a document for them, not really recognizing their true motive was just simply to get Daniel out of their way. What motivated these men to set this trap uh, against Daniel? They set a trap for Daniel through, they were manipulating the king with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, and they got the king to pass this law and issue this edict. Well, Daniel's accusers referred to Daniel as one of those Judean exiles instead of as their chief administrator. He was their chief administrator, so they were really being... Uh, uh, they were really being uh, disloyal to their leader, and uh, jealousy was a big factor. These other satraps were very jealous of Daniel, so they were looking for any charge they could possibly bring against him, but they couldn't find one. Hundreds of years later, the teachers of the law tried the very same thing, and they failed in the very same way when they accused our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's in Mark chapter 14, verses, verse 55. Well, there's some things we can infer about Daniel's character. Darius may have been a title meaning royal one as opposed to a uh, proper name. And some scholars believe this is actually Cyrus the Great, the king who ultimately allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem and uh, to rebuild their temple. That's in Ezra chapter 1. But Darius spent all day looking for a loophole, uh, but he couldn't find a loophole. He, he had to go by the law now, and uh, he was bound fully and completely by the law that he had signed. What a predicament to be in. He loved Daniel. He admired Daniel and trusted Daniel and wanted to make him basically in charge of everything, 
And here these men have uh, circumvented a good, a good man. They've worked against him and set a trap for him, and they succeeded. Well, the king uh, is greatly displeased. He wants to try to rescue Daniel as best he can, but he couldn't. So here's a summary of that, verses 10 through 14. Having been made aware of a decree by the king that forbade prayer to any god other than the king for 30 days, Daniel went into his house and prayed to God three times a day. He was uh, not uh, intimidated in any way whatsoever by this edict. His heart belongs to God, and God's laws always uh, supersede man's laws. So we see that principle here. Daniel obeys God in spite of what men say. You know, in our culture today, uh, people have a tendency to litigate and to um, pass laws that allow them to do things that God would clearly prohibit. And uh, uh, believers in Christ should honor God's laws regardless of whether something is legal or illegal here in the land uh, that we live in, uh, the law of the land. But just because something is legal doesn't mean that God would approve of it. Uh, I would be, I would become familiar with uh, Romans chapters one, two, and three, and look at the Ten Commandments back in Exodus chapter twenty, and consider the things that God has ordained, and live according to those laws. Those laws are going to stand for eternity. The laws of America uh, will stand as long as America is still a country. But um, the laws of the land never override the laws of God. And sadly, it's, it's a tragedy that they don't agree with the laws of God. And so you as a believer have to choose whom you're going to serve. Who is your authority? Who will determine um, what you do or do not do? Uh, where do you... Uh, make an appeal to authority, well, I'm going to go to the Bible. And uh, I'm going to take my chances with the Bible here. I'm sure God is able to uh, stand for those who stand with him. Uh, these uh, enemies of Daniel, they knew Daniel would go ahead and pray, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So they, they just walked over there and caught him praying, and they approached the king. It's a terrible thing to do uh, something like this uh, personally, but they were there was a group of them. They were participating all together to try to uh, ruin uh, Daniel, basically get, get rid of him. And the king, <laughs> when he realized what they had done, uh, he looked for a way to rescue Daniel. He really wanted to spare Daniel, and I'm sure he was really... Uh, furious that he had signed this edict but this is the situation we we have now so as we move on to the rest of the passage here chapter 6 of Daniel verse 15 and 16 the door shut well then these men went together to the king and said to him you know your majesty that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians that no edict or ordinance the king establishes can be changed so the king gave the order this breaks my heart just to think about it the king gave the order and they brought daniel and threw him into the lion's den and the king said to daniel may your god whom you continually serve rescue you a stone was brought and, and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and he could not sleep. All right. 
What a miserable night ahead of him. He's thrown a, a dearly beloved friend and uh, probably the best man that's ever served him in the kingdom. He's thrown him into the lion's den because these evil men had uh, essentially uh, conspired to trick him and got him to sign this edict. He's dug a hole for himself here, and now he's got a long night ahead of him. Well, <clears throat> Darius was a pagan king, and he had been affected. He had observed Daniel's service to God, and he knew Daniel loved God, and he prayed uh, three times a day, and um, he was deeply affected by Daniel's consistent example of serving God. So um, when when we see Darius's response to this uh, trick, you know, once once they've gotten Daniel in trouble now, now he understands the, the plot that they had developed, and he's furious that he's fallen into their trap. Well, Darius prayed to Daniel's God, uh, hoping God would spare Daniel, even though he did something quite foolish, I think. Darius prayed to Daniel's God, and he spent the night fasting on Daniel's behalf. Now, that's quite a contrast between uh, Darius in Daniel chapter 6 and then uh, Nebuchadnezzar back in Daniel chapter 3. If you remember in, in chapter 3, um, you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to bow down to this big statue that Nebuchadnezzar had built. He gives them another chance. You know, he sounds the music, uh, giving them another chance, but they're just not going to bow down to that statue. And rather than uh, regretting his decision to enforce this, he has them stoke the fire in the furnace seven times hotter, and then he has them thrown into the fire. It's a big difference between Nebuchadnezzar's reaction to these men's serving God and uh, Darius, uh, his response to Daniel taking a stand for God. Darius grew more dismayed but Nebuchadnezzar became more enraged, and he ultimately threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into a fiery furnace. Darius more or less reluctantly put um, uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Now, we know that uh, God controls everything, even the sleep of a king, and sometimes God would prevent kings from sleeping in order to accomplish his purposes. Look at Esther chapter 6, and that king couldn't sleep that night, and he's having some things read to him, and he learns about uh, Mordecai, and how Mordecai had basically uh, uncovered a plot to assassinate the king, and he says, well, how can we reward, reward Mordecai? And that leads to the, well, that's a long, you can read that in Esther, and then in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, we see uh, God can keep kings awake at night for various reasons. Well, the law, uh, apparently in those days, could not be revoked. And the law of the Medes and the Persians was a very final type of uh, legislation. And the seal of the signet ring showed that this was done by the authority of the king. And uh, that means it's final and not even the king can change it. So it's a strange uh, way of thinking. It looks like if someone had made a mistake, like the king, well, it's just my thinking here, but it seems to me like if we, if we look at this and we say, well, I've made a mistake, let's change it. Apparently that was not, uh, not possible for the Medes and the Persians here, according to their law. Well, to summarize, chapter 6, verses 15 through 18, the, the door shut. Daniel's enemies pressed the king, and the king gave the order to place Daniel in a lion's den, and the king addressed Daniel, expressing a desire for God to deliver Daniel. The entrance was then sealed, and the king fasted through the night while Daniel's in the den. All right. Well, we've covered quite a bit here so far, but there's a little bit more to go. The, uh, the outcome of this long night, the tables turned. This is from Daniel 
6, and uh, we'll go from verse 19 to 24. I've got a couple of verses on this slide. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they haven't harmed me, for I was found innocent before him. That's God. And also before you, your majesty, I have not done harm. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was brought up from the den, he was found to be unharmed, for he trusted in his God. Okay. There's a little bit more to go. Um, we see sort of a foreshadowing of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. Uh, Darius hurried to the entrance of the lion's den at the first light of dawn. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Um, they were both apparently uh, not sure what, what they would see. The Darius hoped against hope that Daniel would be alive. Mary Magdalene, I don't believe, was expecting Jesus to be alive. She had brought spices to anoint his body. But they both went early in the morning to the tomb. Uh, and uh, this would possibly foreshadow that event. Daniel, by all rights, I mean, if, if, if God had not intervened, the lions would have destroyed him. But here he's alive. He's essentially, uh, it's, it's like a, a resurrection here. He, he's, he was exposed to death, but it didn't take him. Uh, and uh, same like with the fiery furnace. They, they went into the furnace. The men that threw them into the furnace, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the men that threw them in died while the ones who were faithful to the Lord uh, walked in the fire in the presence of a fourth, uh, one like unto the Son of, Son of God. Uh, they survived the fire. Um, they didn't even smell like smoke. There was not a hair on their head that was singed. So God uh, has preserved these stories for us. He faithfully uh, can deliver his faithful servants. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to deliver every faithful servant from harm or, or even death. There are certainly people who get beheaded. There are missionaries who are killed. Um, and uh, Hebrews 11, verses 35 through 40, reminds us of this as does the fact that God did not spare his own son, the Lord Jesus, from crucifixion. So we don't always know how God's going to handle a particular situation, but we can trust him. Even though he may let us die, we can still trust him. He holds our life in his hands, and he can resurrect us. So, well, there seems to be a great amount of cruelty in these verses. Uh, I'm going to go down. Let me go back here and read one more verse here. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Once they got Daniel out of the out of the lion's den, then the king then gave the command, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den, they, their children, and their wives. They had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and uh, crushed all their bones. So uh, the perpetrators here that, that were coming against Daniel through the king essentially met a horrible end the um, Persian practice prescribed death to the entire family of a guilty person. Now, that's 
not biblical, but it was the Persian practice. Deuteronomy 24, 16 would speak against that practice. So God did not decree that Daniel's accusers should be thrown to the lions along with their wives and children. Sometimes the Bible is, is descriptive without being prescriptive. Um, and verse 24 is really a gruesome reminder that Daniel was not spared because the lions were just not hungry. Oh no, they were certainly hungry. It was only God's authority that shut the mouths of these lions. And God will certainly vindicate faithful believers for, for his honor. So as we transition here to the next thing, all right. A summary here of what we've studied. The next morning, the king hurried to the lion's den. He discovered Daniel was unharmed. Daniel explained how he survived, that God sent his angel to close the lion's mouth. Daniel was then brought out of the den unharmed, uh, according to the king's order. Uh, but then the king ordered that the men who tried to get rid of Daniel be thrown into the den along with their families. Oh, my. Well, folks, um, believers can trust God in all circumstances. Believers must worship God alone, even when others try to limit their worship. There's, there's so many examples of that point right there. Richard Wormbrand was a man tortured for his faith in Christ. Uh, countless people have been tortured because they took a stand for Jesus Christ. I remember Corrie ten Boom. Um, she wanted to rescue the Jewish people that Hitler was planning to put uh, in the uh, concentration camps and ultimately uh, uh, he had in mind uh, to destroy them, to kill them in these furnaces. And Corrie stood for Jesus Christ. She, she wanted to rescue as many Jewish people as she possibly could. There was a traitor that came to her, and uh, he told her the Nazis had his wife, and there was someone that was going to release his wife if he could come up with, I think it was 600 guilders. So Corey gave him the money, and he, his wife was not in the uh, concentration camp, but he was a, uh, he was a shill for the Nazis, and when she paid him to rescue his wife, he got to keep the money, but they went out and told the Nazis what she did, so they arrested Corrie Ten Boom and her family. It's a tragic, tragic story. You can read about Corrie Ten Boom. Uh, she's got a website there, and they, they've, she's long since gone to be with the Lord, but her story's been preserved for us. Well, Many have suffered for the cause of Christ, and it's a worthy, if, if you're going to suffer for anything, suffer for Christ. We can turn to God in prayer when we and others face persecution. So always go to the Lord in prayer, uh, come in with thanksgiving and praise, and then when there's a problem with persecution, bring it to him. God vindicates faithful believers for his honor. I can't imagine the the moment when people discover the rewards that they have received for standing faithful, standing tall for Jesus Christ. It's it's I don't believe we can imagine actually what's what's coming. Well, uh, Daniel uh, gives us a model about how to conduct ourselves in the midst of persecution, and uh, he maintains his spiritual disciplines. Uh, even at great cost to himself. Uh, it makes me wonder about my prayer life and my other spiritual disciplines. Um, uh, if, if you knew you were going to be persecuted or tossed into a lion's den for praying, would you pray? Well, Daniel says yes, and he continued to pray no matter what. He didn't want anything to break his relationship with his Heavenly Father. And um, if we have a, a routine prayer life three times a day like Daniel did. Uh, it was uh, not something he had to think about every day. He's going to do it. He's going to pray every day. And uh, what would motivate a person to, to spend 
three times a day in prayer, well, it was a reality for Daniel. He knew the living God, and he loved to talk to him. He liked to uh, give him thanksgiving, and he liked to praise him, and he liked to interact with him, and he knew he could talk to him about anything, anytime. You and I are privileged to have that, that very same experience if we will simply avail ourselves of it. We can pray anytime, seven seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We can always turn to the Lord in prayer. And you know what? He wants us to. He always hears us. He always cares about whatever we're talking to him about. And uh, he can cause things to happen that we couldn't even imagine. He can send people to help us that we don't even know. Uh, there are no limits to how God can can meet a need or answer a prayer. But the idea is take the prayers to him in confidence and then trust him with his answers. Accept his answers. All right. Well, let's go to him one more time here in prayer. Father, I thank you for this uh, example Daniel has set for us. I'm sure you enabled Daniel to do these things. You you conformed him to the image of Christ during his earthly life. And I pray that you'll conform us to the image of Christ. Help us to be as faithful in prayer as Daniel was. And help us to love you and praise you and thank you like Daniel did. And help us to long to be in your presence in prayer. Father, help us to see mighty answers to prayer, Lord. We all want to see uh, the answers that you have in store for us. And no matter what your answer may be, we're going to trust in you. Well, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. I'm glad you joined me today. And if you have any comments or questions, well, I just post them in the comment section. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, like these things. And I appreciate uh, all you, all you uh, followers there. I just really thank you for, for being with me. God bless you. Bye-bye.